one of the glimpses into insanity that I got, and I got a, a lot of them, and I've probably given many people some of them, but one of the glimpses of insanity I got that I, I take with me and I found to have a lot of value, comedically and otherwise, was a man named Howard. We called him Howie. Howie used to work in mortgages with me, and Howie was a small man. He was short, diminutive in stature, but he was very loud. And he talked with his hands like this. And he was what he was who you would cast in a movie like Boiler Room. He was who you would cast in a movie like The Big Short. He was exactly the person that you imagined would occupy that type of space. He drove a BMW truck. He lived in a condo in uh, a, not a great part of Long Island, but it was by the water. And he made no money at the office because he was a horrible salesman. He made the majority of his money selling cocaine. And the cocaine was not good. It was very bad cocaine. It was, it was so bad, you would do it and go, is this cocaine? <laughs> That's how bad his cocaine was. But he, he believed in his head that he was the greatest salesman of all time. And the only other job he had before he worked at our company was he worked at a, a company on Wall Street that was famously, basically, it was a currency trading firm that was essentially just the bank accounts of the Russian mob. And it was, you know, and it was legit, legit in terms of that there was a lot of people making a lot of money, but it was also a complete and total fraud. He comes out of that company and he landed in Long Island with me. And I thought this guy was very funny because he was insane. I always loved people that didn't, that the facts were irrelevant, were completely irrelevant. Like he didn't sell any mortgages and he didn't make any money from our company. But yet, he would still walk around the office as if he was the CFO. Like he was a CEO. Like the guy didn't care that he wasn't. And he would say that he wasn't making money because the company sucked. Like everybody else was making money. <laughs> people were making 30000 a month. I wasn't making that, but there were people making a lot of money. And how I was like a young guy. I was like 22 or 21. And, and maybe even younger. And how he was just this character that liked me immediately because I, 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 I spoke well and I was good on the phone. You could put me on the phone with a client. But I would listen to Howie. And the bosses would tell me, they go, don't say anything Howie says. He's a bad salesman and we probably shouldn't even have him here because he doesn't care. But it was the facts were relevant to him. They didn't matter because he had a condo and he had a Beamer, and people were like, I think his parents paid for it. And people were like, I think he sells Coke to make that money. And people were like, yeah, but the Coke's horrible. Who's buying that? And we're like, good point. So nobody knew how he <laughs> had any of this money, but he didn't even have that much money, but he had enough. His friends had money. People liked to keep him around because he was crazy. I mean, he would, the, 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 the company we worked for was called Franklin First. And he would call people up on the phone and say things that were so unbelievably untrue, provably untrue, baseless, that people would be like, I mean, he call, he would call up people and you'd go, hi, this is Howie from... Uh, Franklin first, you know, Ben Franklin. And they'd go, what? People didn't even know. People would be like, did Ben Franklin start the bank? He'd go, he was involved. <laughs> I mean, people, he said once, he's like, I'm standing in the stock exchange right now in an office overlooking the stock exchange. No, nobody even knew if that was possible. We're like, are there even offices on the second floor of the... But he was calling people in like the middle of the country who had like 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 modular homes. Like he was just <laughs> I remember once he was trying to do a deal with this woman who had a modular home, which is essentially like a double wide on a foundation. And <laughs> he had like a the file. And he's like, he goes, he walks to the secretary's office, he goes, 
what the fuck is the problem? That's the way you. <laughs> that's the way you used to talk to our secretary Kelly, who was just a drunk, smoked Marby Reds, yeah. Marlboro Reds, and she was like, she goes, lower your voice. Who the fuck are you talking to like that? He goes, what the fuck is a problem? <laughs> he goes, I can't close the deal in this goddamn place. And Kelly goes, the woman who told you it's a modular, she goes, it's actually a double wide. So we can't do a double wide. And she'd throw the deal back at him. So then how we get on the phone with the woman and he'd go, hey, apparently it's a double wide. Is this true? Woman goes, no, it's a modular. And then how he would like cover the phone and scream at the secretary. Go, it's a fucking. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, total commission on this maybe <laughs> right. maybe twelve hundred dollars, right? Maybe twelve hundred dollars. But he's screaming. He's screaming. He's got the he's got trying to cover the phone. And he goes, "It's a fucking modular." I told you that. And then and then he get back on the phone with the woman, and the woman's like, "You know, I'm looking at some of the papers, and I don't have the certified modular paper." And then how he goes, "Well, then it's a fucking double wide." <laughs> And how he goes, we don't do double wide. You're wasting my fucking time. And then he'd slam the phone down. And then he'd just walk out of the, and he'd start going like this with his hands. And he would just start, you know, screaming. And then he'd just walk out of the office. He goes, nobody has any fucking money. And the whole, everyone was making money. Everybody had, but it was funny. People thought it was funny. It was like a good breakup of the day. Mm -hmm. I remember I was at his house doing blow with him once. And he goes, I want to move to Santa Domingo because they treat you like a fucking person. I'm like, I don't even know. I just started laughing. I was like, I don't even know what that means. But he was so bad at sales. Like, he didn't know any of the programs. He didn't know how to sell anybody on anything. And he would just try to refinance people that lived in, like, boats. He didn't care. But I, I just started thinking about him because I'm like, the facts never, like, the facts were so unimportant to him. Like if you sat down with him and you showed him like, you're like, listen, buddy, you've closed no loans. You've made no money. He would spit in your face. Like he'd be like, you know, fuck it. He's like, you think, he goes, you think I, you think I'm making money here? Because if I was waiting to make money here, I'd be fucking dead. Are you fucking nuts? You can't, nobody can make any money here. People, the bosses would be like, everyone is making money. Everybody is making money. But he was just completely unhinged. I mean, he did, and I've told the story before, but he did one of the craziest things ever where he sat down at a closing and he said the APR, which is the annualized percentage rate, which is the cost of what the mortgage costs you with all the financing included into it. He literally looked somebody straight in the face and went, they go, why is the APR rate higher than the contract rate, the note rate, whatever? And the answer is, well, it's because it includes the cost of financing. So, But instead of saying that, he said, well, that, honey... That's the average person rate. And you're better than average. So we gave you a lower one. And the closing attorney called my company and goes, we, this guy, they go, this guy is out of control. We can't even. But the amount of times that he would try to refinance a modular home and then find out it's a double wide, because this is a guy that talked big, steakhouses, money, coke. Right. And then he was just trying to refinance homes that people could get in and drive away and then he would find because to be a modular home like you'd hear him on the phone he's like yeah we do modulars do you have the modular certification and then somebody said to him they're like what are you a mobile home specialist he goes will you shut the fuck up i'm on the phone with a client <laughs> and he'd be like do you have the modular paper can you please bring me the modular oh i mean but it got me thinking, what we were talking about earlier in the show is like, there are people that you'll meet in life where the statistics, the facts, the real story, what's actually happening, have no interest to them. It's like they feel about reality the way I feel about astrology. I know like a little about it and I don't really care. <laughs> I see it occasionally in a magazine briefly. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. That's the way a lot of people feel about reality. <laughs> that's the way Howie, Howie, there was this guy, Mike, this guy, Uncle Mike, that used to work there. And he was like the older guy. You, you got to realize all of this, this is a company started by a 24-year-old 
who used to sell drugs and his lawyer was like, we can't get you off if you get popped again. You got to sell something else. So he discovered mortgages and he started making like 90 grand a month because everybody, all the guys that got kicked out of stocks went into mortgages. And I was like a young kid and I went in and I was just on the phone getting applications, handing them off, making a few bucks here and there. Part-time college. I hadn't gone full in yet. I hadn't quit college and bought the house and did all that. But I remember going into this office and there was an older guy who drove a Honda Civic, this guy, Mike. And Mike was the guy who owned the company. I don't want to say his name. I don't want to say everybody's name. Um, But the guy who owned the company, his uncle was like the guy that was supposed to be the office manager, the HR guy, human resources. And he was the respectable guy that was lured out of some version of corporate America, but he drove a Civic. So Howie would be like... Howie would just be like, like Mike would try to talk to Howie about Howie's like behavior in the office, but Howie he didn't respect him because he drove a Civic, you know, and he just clearly was like, didn't have a lot of money. Mm-hmm. And nobody knew how, how he had money, but he had some money. So Howie's just like, I've got a guy in his Civic. He goes, he goes, I got a homeless guy telling me how to behave in this office. He goes, I mean, I don't understand. He goes, how does this office work? You have, you have, you have a vagrant telling me how to conduct myself in the boardroom. He used to call the office the boardroom, by the way. I mean, it's like, if anything could have been less of a boardroom, it was this. Mm -hmm. We gave the guy who delivered, there was a deli called Sujan's, where this Asian guy would make sandwiches. He he answered, go, hey, Sujan. And you go, hi, Sujan. And I go, hi, can I get cracked pepper, turkey, ham, uh, lettuce, tomato, mayonnaise, uh, cracked pepper on a uh, hero. Macaroni salad, Nestle Quick. Talk about a lunch, it'll take you out of the game. (laughs) Sujan go, yeah, 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 okay. And then he would send the Spanish guy that we called Eddie. Who knew what his real name was? It was Eddie. So Howie, swear to God, hired Eddie to start calling Spanish leads. Okay? Howie was like, the reason that I'm not making money is I can't speak different languages. Everybody's like, no, the reason is you don't even know what you're saying. You sound like a crazy person. And the only people that will talk to you are people that have like modular. I will say this about Howie. Funnest person, maybe top three funnest people I've ever spent any time with. Okay? I mean, <laughs> he walked into the Christmas party, coked out of his face. It was like a beautiful like catering hall. Not beautiful, but whatever. Long Island. And he goes, I he walks in, uh, he walks in, uh, he walks in, he looks, he takes a quick look around and goes, Oh, good. A shithole. And then just kept walking. <laughs> Just keeps getting drunk on free booze. He goes, oh, good, a shithole. Um, but he hired this Spanish guy. Three days later, the Spanish guy starts crying in the office. We're like, Eddie, what's wrong? How he gets him to quit his job delivering food at Sue John's Deli. How he gets him to quit his job. He's like, I'm not working. I have no money. How he not give me nothing, man. He give me nothing. And like so Uncle Mike had to call Howie and you, he goes, you can't do this. We never hired this guy. Howie's like, I don't have to run my decisions by you. Mike's like, you absolutely do. You 100% do. You don't know who this guy is. You have him in here calling leads. He's now crying. He's upset. You got him to quit his job. He has no money. He has a daughter. Howie goes, I didn't tell him to have a daughter. He has a daughter. But this is the type of stunts that he would pull. Mm-hmm. This guy was bawling, this poor guy. We went over to him. We're like, we're sorry, man. People are giving him money. <laughs> Howie's standing outside smoking a cigarette. We're like, Did your guy you hired is crying. Howie's like, well, whatever works. Is he doing it on the phone trying to sell leads? We're like, no. He's having a breakdown mm-hmm. because you're not paying him. and You got him to quit his job. Howie's like, well, smoking cigarettes. Well, he used to do that a lot ago. Sociopath. Just crazy. I mean, the guy was bonkers, but so much fun that like it, it's hard to describe how much fun he was. And a guy like that, you're like, oh, he couldn't even do that much damage to anyone because he could barely sell anything. Right. So like as much as you'd want to blame someone like that for the financial <laughs> crisis, he's maybe the most innocent person in the building because he didn't sell anything. He was just selling cocaine to people that would have bought cocaine anyway. In that mortgage office, two people died of an overdose. 
in the time that I worked there. Two. One of them was a friend of mine who I really liked. Uh, he died, and we all went to his funeral. It was fucking crazy. And uh, he died, and then a secretary also died. And, and the guy who sold my friend the drugs worked in the company. So then he had to leave and go somewhere. It was kind of like wild. It was a wild time. I don't know how many of you have worked in that type of environment. <laughs> Probably not many. But it was fucking crazy, dude. And we start, you know, I, I still remember that, having to go to the funeral, having to go into work, and, you know, his parents being there, his sister, you know, going into his desk, seeing his desk. It was very, very hard. And he was a great, this guy was a great guy who died. And it was like sad. It was fucking, it would ripped everybody up in the office. It tore everybody up. And, uh, and the guy that sold him the fucking drug, like, was in the office. So it was like, it was a crazy time to, to exist in this space. So that guy could, like, never go back because people wanted to kill him. This guy's friends were like, we're going to kill this guy. You shouldn't have sold him that, you know? And I I mean, of any situation that I've ever worked in, any situation that I've ever worked in, that first company that I I did mortgages in was the craziest group of people. Forget comedy for a second. Just let's talk about the real world being out there. The amount of people that were assembled in that office were some of the wildest people and the craziest people. There was a guy in that office. There were so many people in that office. But there was a guy in that office. And I mean, I can't say names, but I wish I could because these people's names are so perfect and you immediately start to understand who they are if I said their names, but I can't say their names. Um, but there was a guy in the office who was an older guy. He used to wear like a, a button down shirt with like, like it was like down to here, down to here. And just like his chest hair out. And it was just like, no, everybody was like, what the fuck is this guy doing? And he was just, he was like this Italian guy. His name was Jim something. And, and, you know, think of an Italian food dish that you like. Chicken cacciatore. Call him Jim Cacciatore. Same thing. And he would call people up. And he didn't know anything. So, like, every two seconds on the phone, he'd have to go, hold on one second. And he'd put them on hold. And he'd go, what's the deal with this? And they would go, just get their info and call them back. And then he'd go back on and go, I think the 30-year loan is the best loan for you to take. Well, there's a few reasons for that. Hold on. Why? Why are they taking the why are they taking it? So like on the other end of the phone, you just were put on hold, put on hold, put on hold, put on hold. Cause he knew not like he didn't know anything. He didn't even know what a mortgage was. He had no idea what was going on. Like any every two seconds he'd have to stop and he'd have to ask somebody. And eventually people were like, listen, fucker, just just, you know, generalize. But, I mean, there was, there was a lot of wild people in that office. I will go through them one by one one day on a podcast. I tried to pitch a show that was not that office, but another office that I worked in, which was sadder because it was 2009 and the market had crashed. So it was sadder and therefore funnier, the 2009 office. But the office that I worked in in 2006... 2005, 2006 was the height of insanity, the height of crazy, the height of drugs, the height of my, it was probably, yeah, it was the height of my drug use. It was when I would take a morphine, like somebody hand me a pill, they'd be like, and I'd be like, what is this? They'd be like, it's morphine. I would take a morphine pill and get into my Oldsmobile 88, which barely worked. Like I would hit the brake sometimes and the whole car would stop and I was on morphine and I'm like, oh boy. Like starting it again, getting it going, and then I'd have to continue to drive home. But legitimately, you know, and that's when the Coke came back heavy. The Coke came back super heavy. 
And I would just, I owed money. At one time, I owed people thousands of dollars, just cocaine. And I would just sniff a line of cocaine. And then I would just call people on the phone and be like, hey, how are you? This is Tim Dillon with Franklin First. How's everything going? And then I would, you know, try to pitch them and everything and just do more cocaine and more cocaine. It was bad. It got to a point where I was just, I forget, I was living at that time. I was living in a windowless basement apartment in Massapequa, Long Island, doing cocaine. And then I moved into another apartment in Long Beach, which I barely lived in. And I was doing cocaine there. It was this one, and then I finally bought that house. But the 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 drug regimen was strong, and it was a lot of fucking. It was a lot of late nights at that guy Howie's house, just sitting there listening to him go crazy. Sometimes his coke was better than others. If he was doing it with you, it was okay. If he was selling it to you, it was horrific. And and then we'd go out as a company. We'd get in this little limo, this little shitty old limo. I would drive into the city, and then we'd go to these nightclubs. And then, like, you know, these goons would party and we'd just dance and drink with chicks and do coke. And then the boss of our company just punched this guy once. So then we all got kicked out. It was just like that type of event. Or we'd go to this place, Mirage in Long Island. And Mirage was like this, or it was this massive mega club right in the middle of Long Island. And it was like, you know, Gold Digger just come out and all these crazy songs. Everybody would just dance and do blow and drink. And it was just a, True religion genes and a lot of cocaine. And it was like, uh, you know, 